I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined me to me and heard my cry. He brought me up out of the pit of destruction, out of the miry clay, and he set my feet upon a rock, making my footsteps firm. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and will trust in the Lord. How blessed is the man who has made the Lord his trust and has not turned to the proud nor to those who lapse into falsehood. Many, O oh Lord my God, are the wonders which you have done and your thoughts towards us. There is none to compare with you. If I would declare and speak of them, they would be too numerous to count. Sacrifice and meal offering you have not desired. My, I, my ears you have opened. Burnt offering and sin offering you have not required. Then I say, behold, I come. In the scroll of the book it is written of me, I delight to do your will, O my God. Your law is within my heart. I have proclaimed glad tidings of righteousness in the great congregation. Behold, I will not restrain my lips. O Lord, you know. I have not hidden your righteousness in my heart. I have spoken of your faithfulness and your salvation. I have not concealed your loving kindness and your truth from the great congregation. You, O Lord, will not withhold your compassion from me. Your loving kindness and your truth will continually preserve me. And from Paul's letter to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 1 through 9. Paul, called as an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Sosthenes, our brother, to the church of God which is at Corinth, to those who have been sanctified in Christ Jesus, saints by calling with all who in every place call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God which was given you in Christ Jesus, that in everything you were enriched in him, in all speech and all knowledge, even as the testimony concerning Christ was confirmed in you, so that you are not lacking in any gift, awaiting eagerly the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will also confirm you to the end, blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful, through whom you were called into fellowship with his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Praise Praise God. God. You may be seated. You bow your heads with me and let's get into prayer. Lord Jesus, we pray you speak the word that you want to speak into your church, into our hearts right now. We pray that we would have the ears to hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. We pray, Lord God, that you would help us to be shaped in the image of Jesus. We'd have your mind, your heart, your spirit. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Now I am. Uh, this is an old sermon that I had uh, reworked, and uh, uh, I had this illustration that I've used over and over again when I preached this. And I thought, oh, maybe I should take it out. And I thought, no, maybe I should leave it in. And so I didn't know. I said, well, I'm just going to do it and see what happens. And no one threw anything at me the first time. So we'll go ahead and we'll use it. Uh, and I think it's apropos. It's not a true story. There was a Methodist bishop that died and went to heaven. And when he got there, St. Peter was at the pearly gates and said, why should I do it? Now, the not true part is not a Methodist bishop dying and going to heaven. It's the concept of St. Peter meeting you at the gates, okay? So St. Peter meets him at the gates and says, why should I let you in? And the bishop said, well, why are you not a Methodist bishop? And Peter goes, and? Well, I served as a district superintendent. And? Well, I served as a pastor in the local United Methodist Church for 30 years. Well, and? And the bishop goes, oh. What? While he was pondering, this ragtag dressed guy comes up, besheveled, dirty, and comes up 
St. Peter. And St. Peter says, welcome to heaven. Why should I let you in? And the guy says, man, I'm not, I'm not worthy. I'm, I have been a sinner all my life. And one thing I know is I asked Jesus to be the Lord of my life to forgive me. And St. Peter says, well, come on in. <laughs> and the bishop says, well, I've done that. And the Peter said, well, why didn't you say so? Now, the reason I use that is, church, sometimes we become so caught up thinking that religion is synonymous with the relationship with Jesus Christ. Amen. You know, it, the essence of our faith is, is what Jesus Christ has done for us on the cross. You can be active in a church. You can be in every position that you want to be in. You can be doing the good things, and they are good things. But it's all about the relationship with Jesus Christ, knowing how much he loves you, that he died for you, and knowing that you're unworthy in yourself. Now, here's the sad part, is because we have created this religious structure, we've kind of let the world think that if we just joined a church, that we're okay with God. Hmm. That's a problem. That, I mean, it's a real problem. Even the Methodist Church started off and the John Wesley was an Anglican priest and he wasn't even a Christian. No, he lived like it. He tried to do things, but he didn't have that relationship with Jesus Christ. You see, you and I have some good news. But we need to know what the good news is. Now, the, the word gospel means good news. In the Greek, it's... Uh, uh, euangelion is the Greek, and that means good news. Now, here's the problem with this, and that's a solid translation. I'm not knocking the Greek, but it kind of treats it as a noun. Like, you know, I lost my Bible, but if I hope, I don't have a Bible. Golly, preacher, not a Bible. Okay, if we hold it up like a noun, this is the gospel, okay? This is the good news. And, and it's treated like a noun so many times. This is the standard. This is what the good news is. Now, if you take the Greek apart, you can see the action in the Greek word itself. But in the Hebrew, the Hebrew word, basar, actually means good news, but it's kind of good news. means burying the good news. I mean, what good is the good news if you don't carry it? It, it, there's the action. You have to keep in mind Hebrew words, the root words for all Hebrew words are verbs. It's got to be living. You've got to be doing something with it. It's not a noun static. It's you taking the good news. And sometimes I think the church builds a building and gets a denomination and we just say we got the good news. And what's it good for if we're not burying it? Not bringing it. Now, we have some good news, and it's really simple. I love this, 1 Timothy 1.15. I like the way he says this. In the scripture, it is a trustworthy, right? It is a trustworthy statement, deserving full acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Any of you, anybody qualifies a sinner? If you don't think you do, just ask your spouse or your kids. They'll tell you. Okay. Oh, man. And all of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Every one of us qualifies. Okay? They didn't say how bad you have sinned. In fact, Paul goes on to say, and I'm the chief of sinners. So he says, any sinner. He came in the world to save sinners. And then we realize that this is a gift, and it's a free gift that you can't earn. Ephesians 2, 8, 9. For by grace you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not as a result of works, lest any one of us should boast. So it's not, it's not something that we can earn. It's not about religion. Let me ask you something. See if anybody knows. Uh, raise your hand if you know. When was we, thank you, Jim. What, what's the answer? Oh, by the way, oh, not that background, but the blue background is a picture from Jim's back porch. Okay, looking over the lake, and he sent me that, and I said, man, I'm going to be pe preaching on grace and peace, and that's a powerful picture. I love that picture. And you can't see it, but over here on the side, maybe there's a cross. 
It looks pretty cool. Okay, uh, I had to darken it up just a bit uh, so you can see the words. Okay, when was religion invented? Anybody know, have an idea what religion was invented? I'll tell you what religion was invented. As soon as Adam and Eve said, we got to cover this stuff up. <laughs> well, man, we are naked. <laughs> we need a cover up. Get some leaves. That's religion. And that didn't work. You can't, you can't cover up your sinfulness, your fallenness, your brokenness. Only God can. Okay? Now, you and I have a gospel of good news. We need to be able to proclaim it. We need to be bearing this to the world. Hey, Jesus Christ came to the world to save sinners, and it's grace. And it's not join my church. It's not take my concepts, my theology. It's, it's do you need a Savior? We have a Savior. Okay? And if he can save me, he can save you. All you need to do is receive. So now Paul addresses this letter to the Corinthians church. Now let me tell you something. When you see Paul talking about holiness to the Corinthian church or anything to the Corinthian church, I want you to keep in mind, those were sinners saved by grace. That just cracks me up because when I first started ministry, some of my in-laws and stuff and uh, some of my friends in different denominations go, you Methodists are so unbiblical. Um, what do you mean? What are you talking about? Well, you just, we, we want to go to a New Testament church. Oh, what, like Corinth? That's a New Testament church. Corinth is a church filled with sin and problems. And yet, the Apostle Paul says to this church, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, he's offering grace and peace. See, this is part of the good news. We're saved by grace, and that's how we are made to be at peace with God through Jesus Christ. And so this is part of our message. So I want to talk to you real quick about grace. Being saved by grace, not by works. Every pastor that preaches is praying that his people believe that you're saved by grace. But how many times when someone dies, do you go, oh, tell me about your loved one, and they go, well, they were a good person. Yay! Well, they love plants. Okay, yeah. They love cats. Okay, good. But it's also when someone comes up and says, "Man, let me tell you about my my loved one. They just love Jesus." Oh man, now tell me about the cats. Now tell me about the plants. But I want to hear about Jesus. I just I don't have to know. What all they did, even good deeds, just the fact that they're like that bum saying, I just got Jesus, man. Okay, now, it's exciting when all of a sudden you run into a church and you realize these people have got it. Your salvation isn't based on how much you give or how much you do. It's based on that true relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Let me tell you what grace is. It's very simple. G-R-A-C-E. What does that spell? Grace. Okay. Grace. God's riches at Christ's expense. God's riches at Christ's expense. You can't earn it. You can't deserve it. You, you, there's nothing you can do to get it except receive the gift. In fact, I love it because the Greek word is charis. I have a friend at a and uh, Robert, do you know Bob Santini? Okay, from, uh, he, he knows a lot of people I know from a and Anyhow, uh, and Bob named his daughter uh, Cars Grace. Let's just be Grace or Grace. So I call me Charlie Carlos or something. I don't, I don't know. It's just, uh, grace, Grace, Grace. But I love the, 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 the Hebrew word for it is uh, hey, hey. And it's just two letters. Now, I want you to picture, in the Pano Hebrew, that chet, that chet is a barrier. It is like the Garden of Eden's got a protective barrier around it. It's an enclosure, a separation, and the noon represents life. It's kind of like getting back to the garden. Grace is like God's putting a barrier for you to live life to the fullest inside his protective barrier for you. 
Okay, grace. I want to live in grace. I want to exist in grace. I want to have that freedom in grace. I don't want to be worried. I don't have to be anxious. I've got grace. I love that picture of it. Separation for life. Now, this is where we get really Wesleyan. Okay, the Methodist Church comes out of John Wesley. He takes grace and he divides it into three different categories. Same grace, but this is the Methodist way, divided. <coughs> and it's three of them, prevenient grace, justifying grace, sanctifying grace. Prevenient grace simply means that which comes before. Prevenient, pre-before coming, prevenient. And here's the whole point behind that, is God loves you so much from the before you were born, God loves you. He created you in the womb. I believe the warmth, the nourishment, I believe the spirit is there and you're feeling loved. And he's provided for you. He's gifted you, he's purposed you, the very DNA. He's, we're all individual and he's got gifts in there. And from the day, from your conception all the way through your birth, until the day you say yes to him, he is courting you. He is moving you. He's trying to show himself to you that you are created with a purpose. You're glorious. I love you. And it's a courtship. It's, a, it's, a, it's the grace that he gives beforehand to bring you to the point of conversion. Now, if we look at it in a human relationship, when I was courting Chris, I met Chris, I fell in love. Wow, look at this. I guess I aimed high. People say, how did you get with her? I go, I don't know, maybe she's blind. I have no idea. <laughs> now, I want you to keep in mind. I weighed 130, maybe 25. Uh, she, she knows. <laughs> her prayer was that one day I would outweigh her. <laughs> this is the answer to prayer. It's not gluttony. <laughs> how do you compete with that? So let me, okay, so I court her, but I had one day her ex-boyfriend came to the house. And I'm feeling intimidated because he looked like white. His blonde hair, muscles. He was on the wrestling team. He, was, he had a glisten in his eye. I liked him. <laughs> the only reason she broke up with him because he wasn't a Christian. And in her Bible study, she learned, she made it, became a Christian, that you should be on equal the yoke. So she was like, okay. So she broke up with him. And somewhere after that is when I met her, and I'm a Christian, 130, 25 pound Christian, mostly nose and hair and clothes. Okay? I, mean, I used to put, I used to carry a wallet over here and a Bible over here so I'd have a rear end. <laughs> You may remember that. These guys are, <laughs> I don't know, Paul since high school. And uh, this other Paul I've known since he was there uh, in those days, uh, the college freshman year. Wow. And then I'm, I'm, I'm really worried because after six months, Chris broke up with me. I was devastated. I thought she was the woman I was going to marry. And I thought, oh, and guess what? Mike, her old boyfriend, came back in the picture. He actually answered the phone when I called her house. <laughs> and the jerk became a Christian. <laughs> what do you do now? You got a good looking, studly, macho dude that now loves Jesus. And I said, I go to Rod Nygaard, remember Rod? <laughs> I go to Rod Nygaard, he's older, there she said, Rod. What does a scrawny, skinny, dorky looking Christian like me, what chance do I have to have a beautiful girlfriend when there are good looking, macho Christians walking around? And Rod said, nothing really. <laughs> he said, she either loves you or she doesn't. She either chooses you or she doesn't. That didn't really occur to me at the time. <laughs> but let me tell you something. God is saying, I love you. And I've chosen you. He won't force you. You either say yes or you don't. 
that he's already said yes to you. This cross is a declaration. This cross is a de declaration that he already said yes to you. To you and your sinful state. To your unworthiness. He says yes. And what he wants to do is he wants to show that I'm here. I know you. I know your doubts, your fears, your confusion. I know you're messed up in your thinking. I know that you, you struggle, you're, you're emotional, whatever. And I love you. I remember when my dad had his first heart attack. My mom at 3 o'clock in the morning woke me up. Dad's having a heart attack. Get him to the hospital. I said, man, I'm, getting, I'm going in. I can't even keep the car on the highway now, 410, you know. And I'm just driving as fast as I can and get there to the hospital. No one's on the road, and I'm all over the place. I, I mean, I'm serious. I was like, and I get to the hospital and get him into the ER, and they, they take care of him. He's, he, they, I think he's going to be okay. So I said, I've got to call mom because as far as worry words go, if you look at the encyclopedia under worry word, there's a picture. I mean, and so I thought, oh, man, I've got to call mom. No cell phones back then, right? So I go over to the register, and I go to the for all the ladies sitting there. It's 3.30 in the morning. I go, hey, can I use your phone? Call my mom. She's worried to death. Just let her know, Dad. So we got here, and that's a lot. She goes, I'm sorry, sir, but this is for any, but only for official business. I said, well, if there's any officials coming around, I'll get off. I just want to tell her she's alive. You can't use the phone. I said, well, what phone can I use? She goes, there are pay phones over there. I went, oh. I was, I didn't have a quarter. I don't even know if I have my wallet. I was lucky I had my pants on. <laughs> and I said, do you have a quarter I can borrow? She said, I'm sorry, sir. I can't give you money. Oh, no. Compassion. I went over to that pay phone and said, God, you got to give me a quarter. I put my finger in that first slot, nothing, second slot, nothing, third slot. Father, son, holy ghost. There you go. There's a quarter. I said, thank you. I put it in there. You know what that quarter did for me? It made me feel that God knew my pain. That's all. Call my mom and say, he's alive. Here's look. She's a nurse. And I, because I didn't want my mom with me. Let me tell you something. It's through things like that. It's through things like when Phil Baker comes up to me. The comments and shakes me upside down. All my money fell out. I was embarrassed. That was Bill's hello, Andy. But he, that's not the time he really shook me. The time he really shook me is when he sat across from me at the table in the comments. And he ate his food faster than anybody he could ever see eat. He like vacuumed him up. And he looked at me and goes, Carlos, I think you rely too much on your friends and not enough on Jesus Christ. I went, what? I'm a Methodist bishop. I've been a DS. No, I didn't say I said, I've been in vacation Bible school. I've been in church. I've been in Sunday school class. I didn't. And what he didn't know is I was sprawling <coughs> all around. And Carol was praying for me. And you know what? This Christian boy raised in the church finally met Jesus. It ain't the church. It's the Savior. So he'd been, he been wooing me, man. And you know what? That wooing goes all the way to the day he stands before the altar. And say, I do. Once I said I do to her, she was my wife and I was her husband. Something changed. We were married. Justifying grace is where you accept the invitation of God. You accept the relationship. You say his I do to his I do that he's already said to you because he said that to you. That's what we call conversion, being born again. You know, and you have to keep in mind, it's grace. Grace is, you're stuck in the mud. Listen to this in Psalm 40. He says, he lifted me up out of the slimy pit. I love that slimy pit. Out of the slimy pit. Out of the mud and out of the mire. Man, you're stuck down there. You can't get out. God knows you're dirty. God knows you're smelly. He knows you're a mess. And he lifts you up. Oh, man, you know what you need to do? Is you simply need to say yes. Yes. It takes 30 minutes to get Jeremiah out of a muddy, muddy mire, out of a, 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 a well. God invites you, but you have the freedom to say yes or no. Period. It's your freedom. But when you say yes, 
then you're justified. Just as if I've never sinned before. Salvation. Now, from that point on, though, <laughs> this is what the Christian understands. The day we said, yes, I became her husband, that doesn't mean I was that good of one. This is 40 years of experience. I wish I could go back to when I first got married with the knowledge I have now. I bet you she wishes that too. <laughs> Let me tell you something, church. It's we are washed with the blood of Jesus. We receive the righteousness of Christ. This is the marriage, but I'll tell you what. It's a beginning of being shaped into the image of Jesus. It's where you start realizing that grace. You start realizing that 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 he wants you to grow and develop more into Christ likeness. Like I said, Corinth was a church, a New Testament church filled with problems. They were saved, but they had pride, they had jealousy, they had adultery, they had fornication, they had incest, any kind of sin they had in the church. But you know what? It was to this church that Jesus actually addressed them through the Apostle Paul as saints. Saints by calling. You hear that? Oh, far from perfect, but they're called saints. Now, this is where I get a lot of resistance. People say, oh, come call me a saint. Let me tell you something. It's not my choice. If God calls you a saint, then you are what he calls you. The word saint in the Greek is pagios. It means a holy one. The holy one. I like the Hebrew. Okay? The, the uh, uh, Kedoshim. The Kedoshim. The ones that are set apart. That's what it means. See, he wants his people to be different. He knows that you're going to struggle. He knows that it's a journey. He knows that a young husband is going to say dumb stuff when he shouldn't say dumb stuff. And even after 40 years, I still do that. I'm just smarter, okay? I, I'm a lot slower, and I know when to run, okay? Now, it, God calls us to be different from the rest of the world. Leviticus 19, 2 is talking about the people of Israel. His people, his covenant people, are called to be the Kedoshim, the holy ones. It says, you shall be holy. Kedoshi, holy ones, for I am holy. I, the Lord, Yahweh, your God, am holy. He wants you to have his nature. So God is Kadosh, and he's in you, and you're in him, and you're Kodoshi. Now, you know what? If you refuse to hold that, then you're just focusing too much on you. It ain't about you. It's about God in you. It's his blessing of himself in unworthy people. Now what he wants you to do is slowly practice living like the Kodoshim. He gives you the righteousness of Christ. Yesterday, I was donning my dad's Vietnam jacket, which he gave me in high school. And in high school, you could have got three of me in this thing. Now, you can't get all of me in it. I mean, it's really close. It's shrunk in the middle here. And, but I was wearing that thing. It's one of my favorite jackets. <laughs> it's pretty raggedy. I would drive back to Colorado today, and that's where I left it. I mean, that's, that's what I do. I don't think I trust someone to mail it to me. I'd go get it. Why? Because it's that special to me. But guess what? I've grown into it. But that's just an example. I'm going to grow into the kind of man my dad was. I get the righteousness of Christ, the breastplate of righteousness, and it ain't going to fail. I need to grow into it. I love the story about the two golfers, people who really knew how to golf. Two golfers. Um, one was a, a Baptist, and the other one was a Catholic priest. And Catholic priest would have these long putts, 50 foot, and he would putt, but before he putt, he'd do this. 
And then he put. And he was sinking these things. So the Baptist said, hey, man, I notice you're making these outrageous pots and you're making them, but you cross yourself. I said, do you think I could do that and it helped me? It couldn't hurt. So the Baptist got there and he addressed the ball and he, and he missed. He goes, it didn't help. He goes, well, you've got to know how to put. <laughs> Religion is not a secret. It's not some magic. You've got to practice your faith. I've got to practice being patient with my wife and with my kids. I've got to practice when I'm exhausted holding tight. It's practice. And sometimes I don't hold tight. And sometimes I do. As part of the journey, God calls on us to grow in that. Now, the gift is God's grace. Nothing you can do to deserve it. All you can do is receive it. It's a gift. Now, if you receive his grace, then what you get now is another thing. It's called the gift of peace. But peace comes with seeds. It's a fruit, too. It's a gift, and it's a fruit. See, grace is not love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. Peace is in there. Love, joy, peace. Well, you and I are called to bear fruit, but you got to receive the gift. Jesus said in John 14, 7, uh, 7, uh, 27, Peace give I to you. It's a gift. Jesus said also in John 16, 33, In me you will have peace. It's a gift. It comes as being in him. John 20, 19, he says, Peace be with you. He gives us peace. Now that's a gift. We have to receive that. You know what peace is? Peace is knowing that Jesus is the one who is faithful. My salvation is based on his faithfulness, not mine. You know why? Because I started out as a sinner, and I'm still a sinner who's getting better at walking in the image of Jesus, and as not as stupid as I was before. That is a biblical word. So, and I'm getting better. But my peace comes in the fact that I know even if I stumble, it's based on his faithfulness and his goodness, because I'm still that sinner who needs that grace. So all of a sudden, I've got that peace with God. Uh, he's the one who is going to present me blameless before God. Now, my job is trying to live in that gift of peace. And then take that peace and make sure that I bless people around me. One time, we had this family opportunity. We were going to meet the jabs and, and we are going to meet all this family at Six Flags. And so we're coming from Lavernia. And it's all timed out. We're going to go here, go there, go here, and then meet. And I don't like going to Six Flags, so I've already put out because nothing about concrete and asphalt excites me. Okay? I'd rather be in the woods and the stream, not there. But because I have to be a good husband, I'm going. Yes, ma'am. We get in the minivan. We get all the way down 86, uh, 87, and we get to 410. Right there, we blow a gasket. But there were two gaskets in jeopardy of blowing that day. <laughs> One was that minivan, and the other belonged to someone in it. I won't say who, but he's pretty close to me. <laughs> Let me tell you something. I felt it. Steam is coming up. Steam is coming out of my car. And all of a sudden, I don't know if Chris came up with this idea. I got on the phone. I had a cell phone. And I called Junior Cat at the garage. I said, hey, Mike, can you come and haul my car back and take it to, to uh, Liberty and fix it for me? He said, you bet. I went and told the, the convenience store. I said, we're leaving our van here. They're coming to get it. He said, no problem. I called Mark. I said, you got an extra car, man. Let me borrow it. Come and get us. And he came to God. Us. We spent the day at Six Flags while they fixed my car. You know what? The gasket held. Let me tell you something. I have to go that far back because that's where I could find an illustration. Because I have a choice. One thing I've discovered is if you hang on long enough, that pressure starts to subside. It's a choice. Peace. You don't have to have. Peace. <clears throat> you can't throw a hissy if you want. 
because that third great self is always alive inside wanting to come out. Amen? Amen. Okay, the last thing of that point is peace is also a fruit. Listen, it's one of the fruit of the spirit. You've got to take the seed. You've got to plant it, fertilize it, nurture it. You prune. God's going to prune. God, other people want to prune. And you have a choice to be at peace. It's your, your call. Be at peace. Let the fruit grow. Uh, tend the garden. Take out the rocks. Take out the thorns. Uh, follow the parable of Matthew 13. You see the example of it. You need to get, let that fruit of peace be rooted in grace and mercy and realize it's going to be tested by criticism. It's going to be tested by hardship, struggle, and it's going to be tested by you wanting to carry guilt and condemnation because you messed up. All those things test the fruit of peace. But if you just keep taking it to the love and mercy of Jesus, realizing you're saved by grace, God loves you the way you are, even before you blew it and after you blew it. He knows about gaskets. God, God has gaskets that fit your head all the time when you blow your tongue. He doesn't. Now, the problem is you and I can allow anxiety, worry, fear to rob us of that peace. Those are not the fruit you need to have. Yeah, I always say this. Fear is the dark room where the enemy is going to take you to develop your negatives. You can, there's tons of negatives. You can get all your, all your failures, all your problems, and get in there. And your self-esteem, I'm just not pretty enough. I'm just too tall. I'm too fat. I'm too small. I'm too... You're just, you're just perfect for the grace of God. Because he loves you. Just receive it. Accept it. You are the creation of God. Now... You have a choice of letting the peace of Christ rule in your heart. But this also is what God calls us to do with others. So that he wants us to have the bond together in unity with a bond of peace. And so we need to learn to hold our peace. Sometimes we just need to be quiet. <laughs> Let Jesus do it. One of the, some things, uh, I look so much smarter when I'm quiet. <laughs> you know what? You need to practice the spiritual gifts. The gift of agitation is a spiritual gift, but it's not from our side. <laughs> it's from the other side. The, you know, the gift of criticism and fault finding. I actually believe that my family couldn't see their faults, so I would help them see them. <laughs> That's, that's, yeah, they say in the body, every, there's every part of us has a, pay, a place in the body, the ear, the eye. We can't all be the butt. And sometimes it seems like that's the case. Of peace of Christ. Hold your peace. We have got to stop agitating, criticizing, finding your faults. You know, Paul writes this in the Corinthian church, and there's it goes, has Christ been divided? You know, we may disagree, but somehow, in the way we disagree, we've got to do it with love and peace. That psalm says, man, you dwell with the Lord in his loving kindness, in his truth. You've got to but let loving kindness come first before you start standing on the truth. What I like is, Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1 5, he says that in everything... You were enriched in him, in all speech and all knowledge, even as the testimony concerning Christ was confirmed in you. You hear what it's saying? See, by you being in Christ, you need to be enriched. If you're dwelling in his place of grace, his garden of Eden of grace, then you need to exude grace. If you receive mercy, you need to exude mercy. Love and compassion and kindness has got to be exuding out of us our very nature of who we are. And then, how do we reveal what's going on inside of us? Like I said, you go look real smart if you're quiet, but once you open your mouth, then they know. They know. I, my kid, we're doing this devotion. I'm doing a great devotion. Early in the morning, and my sin's looking very serious. And he's really thinking really hard. He goes, I've been thinking, Dad, about something. I go, oh, great. What is it, son? What is it? He goes, 
did you know when you hold your foot like that, it looks like a hockey puck? I mean, a hockey stick. I'm like, oh wow. Okay, it kind of showed me. Let me tell you something. The way we speak to each other is going to be a revelation of we've been enriched with Christ. The way we speak. Okay, and then all knowledge, all our knowledge. It's the knowledge of His love, grace, and mercy. And we are God's testimony to the world of the difference that He makes in us and the invitation to make that difference in others. So we need to remember that WWJD is not just for what did what would Jesus do, but you really ought to change it to what would Jesus say. If he might say it that way, how would you? Oh, it's really hard, church. This is challenging. Because too many times I find myself in the role of the negative. We don't need to be disparaging attacking, criticizing. We need to be pulling out, drawing out greatness, godliness, potential. He's in the process of taking sinners and transforming them into saints. At any moment, you and I, even though we've done well, can fall over. And I don't but want to be reminded in those harsh ways of my desperate need for his grace. But we need to live it. So if God wants us to have a biblical faith, let me tell you something. This is not my opinion, and it's not up to your opinion. You are a saint. You know why? Because a saint is a sinner who receives the righteousness of God. You are set apart by God to be like him. Period. That's what God says. Now, since you're a saint, then the goal is, let's try to live like it. And don't worry if you mess up. Practice. Because you're saved by grace and he still loves you. Because sometimes saints behave badly. Keep that in mind. Just guard your speech because your speech is a revelation of where you're at. My prayer is that your words will be more like the Savior, which are seasoned with grace, with love and mercy, rather than like Satan, who's the accuser of the saints. Point out the negative, the destructive, the hurtful. So when we say in Psalm 40, verse 4, it says, How blessed is the person, the man who has made the Lord, Jehovah, his trust, I want you to know the word trust is a noun. This is just not saying I'm trusting in him. It is a place. It is a stronghold. It is a refuge. When you live there, you need to let it come through you. It should have an impact on you. You should be the person people come up to and say, you got grace? If you got grace, give it. Got peace? Give it. We should be the number one bearers of grace, mercy, love, joy, and peace. All the fruit of the Spirit should flow through us. So, I close with this slide. I want you to look at it real good. God takes sinners, and his number one goal is to make them sons of God. Bene Elohim. You are called to be Bene Elohim. Okay, and you can only do this in Jesus. From B'nai Elohim, he wants to set you apart. He wants you to fulfill Leviticus 19.2 to be a holy nation set apart. Holy because he's holy. Kadosh, so you need to be the Kedoshim. So you're B'nai Elohim. You're Kedoshim. And then he wants you to rise above and he wants you to be a priest. You are called to be a priest. You are called to be Kohanim, Yehovah. Ooh, we get beyond Elohim, which is the name, just the word for God, to his own name, Yehovah. You are called to be the Kohanim, Yehovah. 
We need to encourage one another to reach out to the world with the good news to say, hey, Jesus loves you. He loves you the way you are. You don't need to change the way you are. Just come. And let God do the changing. Quite frankly, if you're pointing out areas in their life that they need to change, he's probably looking at you and saying, I'm going to tweak that on you just a little bit. <laughs> and let's just celebrate grace, God's goodness, and ask God to forgive us for making religion <laughs> the gospel rather than the Savior. Amen? Amen. Would you bow your heads and pray? Jesus, glory and honor, praise. You are the King. Thank you for allowing us. Thank you, Lord God. We pray that there be joy and excitement in the body of Christ. Lord, this world needs to see hope. This world needs to see light, truth. There's confusion. There's chaos. There's, there's waywardness. There's rebellion. There's, there's lack of, of understanding. There's lack of patience. Oh, Lord, may the church be the one place where truth is bound together with love where mercy and grace is experienced, where joy is shared, where people feel an acceptance no matter where they've been or what they've done. We pray, Lord God, that somehow the church will learn how to take the truth of the word, the gospel, the inspired word of God, and stand on it, but to stand on it the way you did, with love and mercy to those who fall at it and struggle. Help us to be faithful. We pray over every church right now that you would use them to make a difference in all of eternity. Satan would tremble because Christians in every denomination are rising up, committed to the king of kings, the kingdom over their own denominational affiliation. We pray this will be true. In your glory be manifest in your church. We pray this in Jesus' name. Church, we're going to give you an invitation, man. I just... Our praise team is going to lead us in worship. And as they do, you know, it's God is enthroned on the praises of his people. So as we worship, you know, we're, in a sense, we're bathing in the glory of God. My prayer is that you would just allow his glory to get on you, his Shekinah to get on you. Moses kind of raised So today, if you've never made a commitment to Jesus, then you need to do it. It's time. Stop playing your game. If you've never publicly professed your faith in Jesus Christ, get off your lazy time and get up here and just say it in front of us. We need to do that. If you need to rededicate yourself to Christ, you come forward. If you want to make this your church home, you're welcome to make that commitment. We invite you. You know what we need? Just people who want to receive his love. Accept him. If you haven't been baptized, come talk to me about that. If you simply need prayer, I'm going to be standing over here. we got an offering message way over there. We invite you to respond. God leads you. Would you please rise?